practice and and he was he was very proud and and he had all of the trappings that went along with the success that he was enjoying and uh, one of the very high points was the day he could purchase with cash a Lexus a Lexus automobile and he wanted to show all of his coworkers his his fine fine automobile and he pulled up and parked in a place where everyone could see it and they would say whose car is that and he would say that's my car and as he was parking and getting things settled and opened up the door somebody in a pickup truck came cruising past and ripped the door off his Lexus and and of course he just went berserk he uh, jumped out of his car ran around in the pickup truck and started yelling at the guy how dare you do this this is this is my car my brand new car i worked hard this car is a part of me how could you do this and then the police officer came up and said Sir, you know, you don't need to be getting all upset. This can be fixed. And he said, no way. It will never be what it was. It will never be the perfect car that it was. And the police officer said, I can't believe how materialistic you are. And, and he said, I'm not materialistic. And, and the police officer said, when he ripped off your door, he ripped off your arm too. And the lawyer looked down and he said, my Rolex watch, my Rolex watch is missing. <laughs> he had a perspective. And faith gives us a perspective. And that's what I wanted to spend some time talking about this morning. Over the past several weeks, we've begun talking about faith. And our first discussion was that faith is active trust in something that is substantive. It is not just wishful thinking. It's not something we hope will happen. We know it is something substantial, something life-changing. And because of that, we can trust it and we act accordingly. Last week, we talked about the fact that faith is essential to please God. If you want to please God, you put everything on the line for him. And you won't believe how things will move forward in your life. Today, we want to talk about the fact that faith is a way of looking at things and looking at everything. Some Christians miss this perspective in their lives. Some people have, who are Christians, have a lot of knowledge and uh, they don't have the perspective. Or there is the other side, I think, of this where there is perspective and we know that there is a God, but we don't have the knowledge to inform that faith. And, And both of these lead to Christians that can be confused. Perspective means is something, uh, perspective is understanding something because you see things from a different frame of reference. It is the ability to perceive how things are interrelated and determines the place that they occupy in your life. Everything we encounter in life has to somehow fit within the the framework of our belief system. And if we have something that is involved in our lives that doesn't seem to fit the framework, maybe the framework is wrong. You may have seen uh, this news item. Uh, This is a picture of what is called the Orange Revolution. 
took place several years ago, 2004, so about uh, 13, 14 years ago. In the Orange Revolution, the, uh, the people of Ukraine decided they weren't going to deal with uh, what they felt was some inappropriate political uh, hampering into their elections. This is a picture of, of what happened after uh, most people agreed in Ukraine that, that the elections were stilted on, on the, the behalf of a Russian-backed, the existing prime minister, whose name was Viktor Yanukovych. He was uh, being challenged by Viktor Yushchenko. Make sure I have those names right. And and the people just knew that this wasn't correct, that uh, that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm missing the, the pronunciation, and I want to say the right thing. There we go. Viktor Yushchenko was the opposition leader. Viktor Yanukovych was the Russian-backed prime minister, and, and he won just by a slight margin, and, and they discovered that there was voter fraud. And, and the people began to demonstrate in Parliament Square, and orange was the color that represented uh, this movement. And, and, a one, and one woman, Natalia... Dimitruk was a translator, and she would go down and see the, the, the opposition. She would go down and see the protests and knew that the protests were on the side of what was right, yet she would have to go do her job and do the translation of the news and give the state line of what happened. And, and she could see that there was a big difference in, in what she was seeing on the square in the, the protests and what was happening in real life. She said, I was observing it from both sides and, and I had a very negative feeling. After every broadcast I had to render in sign language, I felt dirty and wanted to wash my hands. The opposition had no access to the state-run media. But Natalia was in a special position, and she had a perspective, and she knew that she could do something. And so, on November, the, the, the vote took place on the 21st. On the 25th, she walked into her studio, and she said, I was sure I would tell the people the truth today. I just felt like this was the moment to do it. The newscaster was reading the officially scripted text about the results of the election, and Natalia was signing along, but then she said, I was not listening in her own daring protest. She said, I am addressing everybody who is deaf in the Ukraine. Our president is Viktor Yushchenko. Do not trust the results of the Central Election Committee. They are all lies, and I am very ashamed to translate such lies to you. Maybe you will see me again. I do not know. She, uh, in the interview, she said, my legs became so heavy and I was terribly scared. But why would she continue to do what she did? Why would she put her life on the line? And it's because she had a perspective. And the perspective that was shaped by truth was demonstrated in action. In the story that Jerry read today, he referenced Noah. And I wonder the same question. Why would Noah do what he did? 
He was one person in an entire world that in Scripture we read that that every inclination of humanity was evil all the time. So why would he do what he did? Why would he build the ark and and uh, put his life at risk, be a, a ridicule for the entire society? And what we read about him in Genesis chapter 6 is that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. He was an individual who, who shined before all of the other people that lived during his time. And I don't think it's an understatement when it says he was blameless among his contemporaries. Verse 8 says, Noah, however, found favor in the sight of God. So there was something unique and something specific about Noah. And it has to do with his perspective. In the passage in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, it says, By faith, after he was warned about what was not yet seen. And, and when you read back in Genesis 6, you see that, um, that Noah was told that the entire world was going to be flooded. And that seems like an, a pretty incredible thing to be told. A pretty amazing thing to deal with. But it said he accepted it and in godly fear was motivated to build this ark. A lot of times we struggle with things in life. When I think about the extent of time that it took Noah to be faithful to God, I think about myself that, that I'm just, I'm just sometimes, I don't have that perspective. Sometimes I give up. Sometimes I think like the things I'm facing are too difficult and nobody should have to face these things. And maybe Noah had those times where he felt the same way, but, but he was faithful. And, and in the end, his actions didn't only affect him, though many people perished in the flood, humanity was given another chance. Humanity was given another opportunity And we live because of his faithfulness. And so I want to encourage you this morning to have that same perspective that he had. That would cause you to do things that truly make a difference in the lives of people. That that truly are are unique. Uh, The actions of of Natalia in uh, willing to, to use her 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 uh, her job, her responsibility uh, that really set off a chain reaction in her world and led to a new election where Viktor Yushchenko was made the Prime Minister of Ukraine. Her actions were risky. Her actions were bold but they were based on her perspective that was shaped by the truth. And I believe that's the same for us this morning. And when we have this perspective, there are going to be several benefits, and that's what I wanted to spend the rest of our time talking about this morning, is that perspective causes us to love God more. The goal 
of, of God's work in our lives is, is not self-centered. The goal of God's work in our lives is that we might be mature and able to fulfill the work of God through our lives. And so the more we know, the more we know about the Word of God, growth is going to take place. Christian growth happens when you keep in step with the Spirit. And, and I've underlined those words, keep in step, because that refers to action. That my keeping in step means I'm, I'm taking action that is consistent with the actions of the Spirit. Over a period of time, I, I begin to change from the perspective that I had before I became a Christian to having the mind of Christ. That's God's goal for our lives, to have uh, the mind of his son Jesus. And, and that uh, we could, uh, we've, been, we've talked about Noah, we've talked about Natalia, we could talk about Jesus, that Jesus had that focus, that perspective. That's what enabled him to follow through with what he did. His actions and his perspective were shaped by truth. Ephesians 3.18, Paul prays that we will grow in that love and and that it will direct our steps and that we'll know how high and deep is the love of Christ. The more we love God, the more accurately we love. And correctly, we can love ourselves. One of the key aspects that has to change in our relationship uh, is, is what's more important, what God thinks or what I think. If, if it's more important what I think, uh, then my actions are going to benefit myself. But if it's more what God thinks... I don't worry about myself. I'm not concerned about myself. Because I know that God is taking care of me. And then my actions are shaped by that reality. And and I can look at myself in a different way. Some people look at themselves from the perspective of their failures. Uh, some Or their, their perceived failures. Some people look at themselves from their uh, perceived... Uh, uh, the things that are against them, that they think in their minds that because I have this, uh, you know, there's just no way I can do what God wants me to do. But the more I love God, the more I can see who I really am, that there is value. And, and, it, and, and the more truth that is in my life, uh, I, am, I become more committed to live that truth out. Perspective helps us to resist temptation. Uh, it teaches us to, uh, to understand what is most important in regards to how I live my life. It helps me look at things differently. It helps me see the long-term consequences as opposed to short-term pleasure. Before we become Christians, and oftentimes as we are learning how to follow Christ, uh, we follow from our viewpoint according to our natural inclinations. And our, our natural inclinations are to, to do what brings me pleasure, to do what benefits me. And oftentimes those are, those are the motivation for the temptations. That uh, the temptation is out there, and because I'm motivated by pleasure, then I will give in to that temptation. Proverbs 14.12 says, there's a way that seems right to me. What happens is I learn that, that in the end, in the end, it leads to death. Perspective helps us to handle trials. When we have God's perspective on life, we realize that God is working for my good in the circumstances that I, that I face. And, and that's a hard perspective to have. That's a hard, 
that's a hard thing to see sometimes because my, my circumstances can overwhelm me. But if I know that God is working for my good, then I'm going to watch and see what God is doing. I'm going to accept the fact that trials produce endurance. They make me stronger. It's like lifting emotional and spiritual weights when I am able to go through trials with this perspective. Now, if I have another perspective, trials can beat me down. If I'm thinking about my own worries and my own concerns, those trials will beat me down. But if I'm thinking about uh, what is God, what's going on, what is God trying to teach me through this, those trials will make me stronger. Uh, I have the same mindset that Jesus had. That was for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So there was, from his perspective, there was something more important ahead than what was happening to him right now. For him, it wasn't... uh, short-term pleasure, but really, it was short-term pain. But he's able to look ahead and, and see the joy that would become through this life of obedience, and so he was willing to go forward. We read the statement of Paul, and, and sometimes this statement just, it confuses me because it doesn't make sense. When I am weak, then I am strong. That doesn't make sense. But from God's perspective, it does make sense. Uh, when, when I am at my weakest, that's when I, I leave room for God to come in and make those changes and make that difference in my life. And then one more point. Perspective protects us from error. I was going to say probably at, at, at no other time is, is this point more important. But I suppose that every faithful person of every generation has felt this way too. That right now we need some truth. Right now we need some clarity. Because what a lot of people believe is, is, it's, it's leading to a lot of confusion. Sometimes Christians are seen as narrow-minded because we do feel like truth is important. And so often we're told that that our problem is is, uh, the fact that we're just narrow-minded. We can't, that our perspective is narrow. But I don't think that's a bad thing because our perspective is being shaped by truth. And that means some things are true and some things are not. Today, probably, probably the most prominent religion is pluralism. And I put this definition with my presentation this morning, not because I agree with it, but I think this is a definition for pluralism. And pluralism involves moving beyond the acknowledgement of differences to understanding, action, and respect to build a better world. Is this God's goal? I think this is one of those times where we can look at what's going on in our lives and and sometimes it's confusing about whose side we're on. This this is not God's goal. God's goal is that the whole world would have his perspective and not that his people and not to to achieve this, 
from the perspective of God's people, we're going to have to compromise. We're going to have to overlook some things to achieve this goal. And, and so if, depending on my perspective, I may see this as a goal that I can buy into. But I don't think it's a goal that God buys into. Because if we're going to have a better world, what's needed? Grace and truth is needed. Not just a a decision to overlook things for the sake of getting along. See, the problem is not that our culture doesn't believe in anything. The problem is that our culture believes in everything. And that everything is okay. Everything is to be accepted. Everything has equal value. Every belief is equal. But is that true? And this challenges us in the world that we live in today. This, this challenges us uh, in what we do when we go to work tomorrow. Because to be a good employer, you almost have to embrace this. I don't, I say almost. But oftentimes, if there's something that, uh, that we read in God's word that challenges the status quo, We're, we're told to stand down. We're told to, uh, to not make waves. We're told to, uh, keep our views to ourselves. And so we kind of have to accept this to get along in our world. And I say we kind of have to accept this. We have to be respectful, most definitely. We have to understand where people are coming from, most definitely. But the only way things are going to change for them in the eyes of God is for for truth to shape them. The only way things are going to change in our society is for uh, the majority of people in that society... To embrace God's truth. Which means sometimes we need to change. And that's not a bad thing. But it is something that people of faith have had to do throughout all time. And so really our challenge this morning is, are we going to step in that gap in a way that is graceful and loving? I think God's people have, and this is an I think, uh, observation, limited amount of time, that, that how we have approached change and in trying to influence change in our culture, has been harsh. I've experienced that. Maybe you have too. And I don't, like, I don't know if, um, if Noah... How long did Noah work? 
100 years, something like that. He probably had some discouraging times throughout those 100 years. But if he was blameless in his, uh, among his contemporaries, what would that look like? And it would probably be that, that his character, that the way he talked with people, since he understood really what's coming down, was in a way that, uh, that was caring, warning people that, that things were, were coming. In some sense, that reality exists today. God is going to pull all this to an end. At some point, God is going to uh, say, time's up. And, and we'd, we'd better be ready. It seems like most of the people that Noah warned didn't listen. And so perhaps that's going to happen. Even if you're the nicest, kindest, most graceful and loving person on the planet, people still may not listen to you. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stop building the ark. All Natalia had was her hands to communicate truth. And she risked her life. But she was going to do what was right. And and sometimes following Christ looks like that. Sometimes following Christ takes a stand against the things that culture tells us we need to embrace if we want to get along. So why did God choose Noah? Because... He had a perspective that was shaped by the truth. And that's what I want to encourage you to think about for your life this morning. Do you have that same perspective? That is shaped by truth. That will cause you to do something that is risky, unpopular, may get you into a lot of trouble, but is in obedience to to God's will. Are you changeable? Are you moldable? Are you willing to accept uh, the truth of God even though it might make you unpopular? This morning I want to encourage you to seek his perspective. And if you don't have that perspective this morning, seek it. Ask for it. Say, God, I don't, I, I feel the way I do about things and, uh, and uh, I, I know that there's something different coming from your perspective. Help me to understand that. Help me to embrace that. Help me to see where I'm wrong. Help me, help me to see where I need to change. Because God's goal isn't a, a better world. It is people with a restored relationship with him. This morning, if you desire prayers of the congregation uh, to, to help direct your life toward that, the elders will be in the back parts of the auditorium uh, waiting for you uh, to pray with them. If you need to begin that walk and begin to open your mind to that perspective that God gives us, That's what baptism is all about. What baptism does is it gives us 
God, uh, it, it begins to give us God's perspective uh, through accepting that I'm wrong, believing that I need to change the direction of my life, finding a solution for my failures, and embracing the power of the Holy Spirit, which is really where we began to transform from the mind of me to the mind of